there's a critical portion of the, um, the reply that I want to read and explain. And this has to do with how Donald Trump's attorneys weave presidential powers in a way as to find an excuse for the crimes Donald Trump has committed. Under Youngstown, Youngstown is a court precedent, Supreme Court precedent. Under Youngstown's third category, Congress may not infringe the president's exclusive powers. But the indictment here repeatedly seeks to infringe exclusive presidential powers. Among others, it purports to criminalize President Trump's deliberations about whether to remove and appoint the acting attorney general, thus infringing an unrestrictable power of the president. The indictment purports to criminalize President Trump's urging DOJ to investigate and prosecute reported federal crimes, violating another quintessentially executive function. The indictment purports to criminalize President Trump's public statements through official White House channels on matters of federal concern infringing the president's extraordinary power to speak to his fellow citizens at, and on their behalf. The, indict, the indictment purports to criminalize President Trump's communication with the vice president and members of Congress about their exercise of legislative authority, infringing on his authority to recommend Congress's consideration such matter, such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. Well, there's a huge problem here. The problem being, what was the end goal of each of these actions? It was a private end of staying in power past his tenure after he lost in the 2020 election. So, among others, so it purports to criminalize President Trump's deliberations about whether to remove and appoint the acting attorney general. Well, why was he trying to remove the acting attorney general? Because Bill Barr, the, the attorney general, had refused to investigate any claims of election fraud because there were no viable claims of election fraud. And then after he uh, resigned, the acting attorney general was doing the same thing and advising the president that there is no evidence to go after election fraud. And that's why Donald Trump got Jeffrey Clark, who is a, um, an, an environmental lawyer with the DOJ, to be acting attorney general, but it was thwarted by a threat of mass exodus of attorneys who were both working in the White House and the DOJ. So the goal of, of appointing or removing the attorney general was premised on the private criminal act of telling them to go after election fraud where there was none. The indictment purports to criminalize President Trump's urging of DOJ to investigate and prosecute reported federal crimes. Federal crimes were being reported by nobody except for Donald Trump. And after conducting the investigations, Donald Trump's people would come up to him and tell him that there was nothing there. And Donald Trump didn't believe them. Donald Trump instead believed his private attorneys Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, uh, John Eastman, and the lot in pursuing private ends despite the fact that he went about it by using his official powers. Then he exhausted the official powers, and then he went into private contact with these private lawyers that were representing Donald Trump in his private capacity as somebody who was about to usurp the will of the American people. So the indictment purports to criminalize President Trump's public statements through official White House channels on matters of federal concern. The federal concern here being 
election fraud that wasn't existent. He's fabricating a premise and therefore and thereby using his extraordinary power to speak to his fellow citizens. But that speech is lying to them about what is happening in the elections. Then the indictment purports to criminalize Trump's communications with the vice president and members of Congress about their exercise of legislative authority. To what end? To stop the certification process and on the flip side, to take in fake electors that are not the legitimate electors signed and certified by state legislatures. Now, he can talk to uh, vice president and members of Congress about legislative matters, uh, uh, about their exercise of legislative authority and recommend measures that he judges to be necessary and expedient. But that's not what he was doing. That's not the power that he was exercising. What he wasn't uh, recommending. He was telling them that you need to stop the certification and allow these fake elector forms to come up and take the place of the real elector slates that had been certified and sent to the states, uh, sent to Congress by the various states. So then later on, it says the only overt conduct that respondent attempts and fails to, to identify as supposedly unofficial conduct is the alleged organization of alternate slate of electors. Jack Smith's indictment is pretty clear on the overt act of these alternate state, slate of electors. And it is official, unofficial conduct. And the fact that it that Donald Trump's attorneys detach it and puts this particular nugget of fact much later in their argument of how the president was exercising his uh, powers under the Constitution, they leave that bit out because that bit doesn't fall into any presidential category, you see. So all in all, the private end of usurping the, uh, the votes to nullify the votes of the American people, Donald Trump employed these means. and. Some of them may have been official in his official capacity of appointing or removing his subordinate officers, but it wasn't because of any conduct. Of course, he, he was his actions are unrestrictable, but honestly, they were restricted by the mass exodus threat of, of attorneys from both the um, uh, Department of Justice and the White House. And... It is important, and I think that when we hear the oral arguments on the 25th, we will hear um, the government call upon these parts where Donald Trump has no extraordinary power to lie to fellow Americans. He doesn't have the power to uh, advise the judge, uh, um, to the, sorry, Congress, on measures that he judges necessary and expedient. And all of these things that he has done, he has done in the context of elections. Remember that. That is the overarching thing here. Article 2 of the Constitution provides exclusively that elections are the purview of Congress, states, and electors. The president under the article that vests upon the president all the awesome powers of the presidency, does not give the president any power or authority to go after and administer or be in any capacity part of the election process. And so these acts that he was doing, he, they were motivated by election fraud. Federal crimes on election fraud, matters of federal concern of election fraud. He doesn't have power over election integrity. That is up to Congress, states, and the electors. So 
those federal concerns are divested to other branches of the government and state governments for this very reason, that president does not have any authority to go into them and change leadership in his um, um, in his uh, retinue or have uh, um, lie to the American people or um, talk to members of Congress about election fraud. There's no provision in the Constitution that gives president's powers to go talk about the elections because that power is taken away from the president by the constitution itself. So that I wanted to bring that part and talk about uh, this particular uh, phrase, you know, this excerpt that uh, Donald's lawyers have come up with. What I can tell you is that the 25th of April oral arguments will be extremely important to listen to because the way that the Supreme Court phrased the question slants it towards understanding that the acts committed were allegedly official acts. The, Jack Smith argues that those acts were private acts. And even though there may have been some official channels through which Donald pursued these acts, they were private acts to a private purpose with private people about undoing the 2020 elections. And those private acts are not covered by criminal uh, immunity that presidents enjoy. So first question will be about the former presidents, whether they have immunity or not. And even if SCOTUS says that former presidents do have some residual criminal immunity, the question will be whether they have uh, presidents have the power over uh, determining and recommending and interfering in election matters. The answer would be no, because Article 2 divests that power. And do private and does he have the power to go on and conduct these private acts to a private end that has nothing to do with the official proceedings of counting the electoral votes and certifying the elections, which is a purely ministerial function after the states have certified the results, those don't fall within Donald Trump's official duties. Those are those fall within private acts because again, the constitution doesn't allow the president powers over election matters.